Hello, welcome to my talk called IoT Fails, Learning from Sex Toys, How Not to Suck or Blow. So who am I? I am Renderman, Canadian, uh, very proud Canadian hacker, researcher, security and penetration tester, founder and researcher for the Internet of Dongs project, uh, basically where we test the security of internet connected sex toys. I am Pope of the Church of Wi-Fi, and our team is the uh, two-time champion for Hacker Jeopardy as of this year. I've uh, been to every DEF CON since 1999, uh, 2020 notwithstanding, of course, and look forward to continuing to do so in the future. So I want to be serious. This will be a discussion that does involve sex toys and other intimate devices. This means some language may be considered crude by some, possibly offensive to others. If you're likely to be offended, then I suggest you don't watch this video. Uh, I do try and keep things PG rated, but some items, you know, have a name that could be considered offensive to some. These are legal devices sold worldwide. Any humor that may be uh, injected is uh, uh, objective aspects of the devices and in no way making fun of the users or their lifestyles or any aspect thereof. Uh, these people who use these products and buy them deserve the same safety, security, and privacy as any other consumer of IoT devices. So IoT security in general is a dumpster fire. It's almost an oxymoron. Every week, some new device has a you know, hard-coded password or they leak you know, personally identifying information everywhere. We're in a day and age where you know, a coffee maker is a threat to the command and control systems for a chemical power plant. Uh, mistakes are being made in IoT that were made 15 years ago, stuff we thought we dealt with, thought that you know we were past. We know how to solve these things, but they're coming back. Things like default passwords this should be a long, you know, something that's long past. There's very little discussion about the roots of the problem as I see them anyways. Um, and things need to change in this industry before people start getting hurt. But first, first, let's build a car. Obviously not a real car, but more as a metaphor, because this is something a lot more people are, are familiar with. A car should have four wheels, steering wheel, seats, engine, brakes, doors, windshields, mirrors, you know, all the, the usual things. You know, if we were handing this as a design to someone, we could say, okay, the wheels need to be in the corners, you know, engine in the front or the back, depending on the, the mount. Seats are inside, not on the roof, you know, windshield in the front, you know, the usual kind of, you know, what delineates a car. So the uh, designers go off, design, build a prototype of the car, run around a track, you know, a bunch of times. Yep, everything works. It's, you know, as, to, as was uh, requested to be built. Okay, so they prove it for sale. And then they find that after 5,000 kilometers, every car explodes, killing all the occupants. Obviously, this is a bit of a design flaw. But you'd hear arguments like, well, you didn't specify the car shouldn't explode after 5,000 kilometers. You know, if this was IoT, they'd say, well, the user wasn't operating it like they expected them to. We never actually assumed that they would you know, try to go faster than the speed limit. Um, well, it worked because it you know, was designed to meet the acceptance on the test track because that's the only provisions we had. We only had very narrow time on the uh, test track, so we only tested it to you know, 100 kilometers, not 5,000. Or things like it met nearly every non-existent uh, regulation for the industry. Obviously, cars are a lot more regulated than IoT, but you can see these kind of arguments wouldn't necessarily pass in you know, an automotive industry. Right now, we seem to be building a lot of homers. And if you're familiar with The Simpsons, there's a wonderful episode in season two where Homer's asked to design you know, the, the car for the everyman. And he you know, puts every crazy idea he has out on the table and the designers, you know, dutifully say, yep, yes, okay, yep, we'll, we'll do that, no matter how crazy it is, no pushback. So they take this crazy design and make this car, which is a complete monstrosity that ends up actually destroying the company. 
you see this with a lot of IoT kind of situations. It's like, well, you didn't specify that it had to be secure in the documents, you know, in the design documents. Really, why why should that be necessary to specify? You know, you said it should be secure, but we have no idea how to actually check that or what criteria to use or anything like that. You know, previously we've only built, you know, devices that didn't need to be secure or, or you know, it wasn't a priority. You know, we thought it was secure. You know, we, we got an SSL certificate, but, you know, don't know how to use it and install it. You know, your design specs didn't say we couldn't just store everything in plain text in an online bucket with no password. Again, why should this be something you have to specify? We always assume the user would always have connectivity and the servers would never go down. This is something that's caused a great many uh, issues where an assumption of always on internet connectivity that, you know, things like, uh, uh, you know, Amazon outages or, you know, the local client's uh, internet connection goes down. These should not be showstoppers or put people at risk. I've spoken to many Internet of Things, Internet of Dongs vendors, and they always say the same thing. Privacy and security of our customers is of the utmost importance. This is the InfoSec equivalent of our thoughts and prayers are with the victims. Platitude that does nothing. And it should be secure. Should be the default for any design. Why should it be necessary to specify? You know, and part of that problem is many companies, you know, they'll see the headlines about IoT hacks. You know, they'll see, you know, uh, Amazon buckets that are, are wide open, leaking all the customer's information, but they don't realize that they're an IoT vendor, that they're now in the same ballpark as a thermostat, a baby monitor, a refrigerator. You know, refrigerator manufacturer might say, well, we build appliances. You know, we're not, you know, an IoT company. It's like, well, yes, you are. And because I've had so many of these conversations where I've brought literally their entire user database to them and said, hey, you have a problem, it's amazing to watch the change that happens just after one conversation when you point out you're a software company now. Because in, you know, Internet of Dongs and adult intimate devices, most of them went from a hardware device maker to a software and service provider pretty much overnight. And they never realized it. They may have had good people on staff for, for material engineering, design, some electrical, but never anything networked. You know, they never had to deal with the problems of connectivity. One of my favorite sayings is that on the internet, you're 100 milliseconds away from every jackass on the planet. Meaning if you connect a device to the internet, somebody somewhere is going to be poking and prodding at it. And that changes the threat dynamics dramatically. A previous, you know, analog device that just you know vibrated or buzzed or, or whatever didn't have the possibility of somebody remotely reaching out and connecting to this and causing it to do things that maybe wasn't meant to many vendors just rolled their own systems they didn't use available frameworks that had been vetted and trusted um, they thought they knew how to implement an api and you know for some they did a good job others not so much Many request, uh, companies will go to a third party and say, hey, we want a device that does this, 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 and this. And the company will dutifully you know, design and make to that stick. But they don't go to DEF CON. They don't hang out with people like us. They don't know what questions to ask. So when they you know, make assumptions like it's secure because, well, shouldn't it be? You know, or they ask the company, you know, well, is it secure? They don't know to ask well what are all the SS, uh, outside connections SSL uh, and TLS uh, encrypted what version of TLS are you using you know those sort of things they don't know what they don't know much of my IOT work has been with the Internet of Dongs project it was started basically because I wanted to learn mobile security web app API security um, at the time, I was being given a bunch of projects for that, and most of them were fairly secure, and I needed something with some, frankly, low-hanging fruit uh, to kind of cut my teeth on. Many of these devices and apps have text, voice, video, and others, you know, uh, 
uh, other devices will sync with video and even allow bi-directional control from the devices themselves. This is rather amazing. I mean, you have these apps that are essentially a new communications platform, you know, like Skype or you know, Google Chat or anything like that. But it's being run by companies that don't realize this or they, they've outsourced so much of it that it's being run by people who don't have vested interest in this. And it's a very fascinating field of study, especially in these you know, socially distant times. Relationships are suffering, and this is a way for people to stay close. But these kind of devices have a unique um, set of challenges because they are so very intimate. The privacy and security expectations from the users is much, much higher and has you know, some very unique challenges too. So it's something that a lot of people should be paying more attention to. No one else was seriously looking at this when I started the project in 2016, and I have no embarrassment in uh, pursuing this, and I'm actually very proud of the work I've done, because the things that I have found have been terrible and terrifying. A lot of devices will you know, give data to the vendor, you know, telemetry, stuff like that. You know, how many times a day your connected fridge is being opened each day may not mean a lot to people. You know, some people are like, okay, maybe I snack a lot and you know, opening the fridge too often. But how many times a day you use your sex toy, that means a lot of different things to people than their fridge. Cultural implications, you know, taboos and shame can have severe consequences. The Ashley Madison breach, there were many people that were found to be uh, customers of that site that committed suicide because of the shame they felt in being you know, caught. Um, most of these devices are a Bluetooth device connected to a mobile app, some sort of you know, web API. There's obviously exceptions, but almost all of them use common off-the-shelf chipsets you know, from Nordic, TI, whoever. So essentially, except for the wrapping, these devices are the same as any other IoT project, product, uh, products, be it different appliances, children's toys, you, know, you name it. Um, so it's a very interesting way of looking at the industry through this, this frankly, uh, underobserved branch. Normally, I follow a, a policy of coordinated disclosure with the vendors and establish a good relationship with many. I've helped many of them set up a vulnerability disclosure program. Most of them didn't realize that people would ever, you know, try to program, uh, reprogram their devices or, or hack them in some way, and they had no idea how to take in uh, vulnerability reports or how to deal with them. Uh, it's a very simple step that I'm, I'm glad to see most have done. This is also one industry where most I've found are genuinely naive about security. It's not a case of they don't care or you know they're cheap or something like that. They, they just did not know. And I've been glad to see that most have stepped up when they realize what the problem is you know, to educate themselves and get things better. But there's always you know, exceptions. So the first device I want to talk about is the cock cam. This is one of the crude name devices, but that is its brand name. This is a genital, genital mounted webcam. Uh, make of that what you will. Uh, it was founded by a group of guys in the UK who came up with this crazy idea. I would not be surprised if a few beers were involved in this. Uh, managed to get a hold of a, a early uh, production version in uh, 2018. And things got very interesting very quickly. So this device is a Wi-Fi enabled camera and by default, it creates its own access point that the mobile app is then used to connect to and then uh, configure the device. One of those settings is to connect to an external network. That's kind of scary. Because it now has an IP address, you, you know, run an Nmap scan on it, and it was identified as a D-Link 932L uh, webcam. And you, know, you see the pictures there on the slide, that you can kind of see where the, the similar hardware uh, under the surface is being used. Um, it's got 
uh, micro SD card support for storing the videos, but also will stream to the mobile app for recording. Uh, it's essentially an ARM system on a chip, and it's running BusyBox Linux. So I can legitimately say, I got root on a cock cam, and continuing to make my mother proud. I found a lot of common IoT issues that it carried over to IoD, but when you start thinking about it in terms of this being an adult device, the sort of content that uh, it's being used to generate, the implications get a lot more serious. There was an FTP server enabled on it that allowed anonymous access with no password as root. This account had full read and write permissions to the entire file system. Literally the worst case scenario for this kind of issue. With this, you could overwrite the password hash and also log in via Telnet then, because you now know the uh, password that you set the hash to. The streaming server component of the firmware uh, had credentials to the network and other things in a plain text file, uh, including uh, passwords to uh, an update server that wasn't necessarily for the COCCAM product. This was interesting because it showed that there was a whole bunch of other vendors' components in there that hadn't been sanitized. So essentially anyone on the network can download any stored videos from the SD card or you know, connect and stream from this device. The camera firmware contained fragments of other companies' software functionality, and this was essentially, you know, as I said, a 932D link camera network webcam. It had the IP camera web interface still in it, uh, if you knew where to look, and that even allowed you to use it to bridge into a Skype session. Not sure I would want to take that phone call, but so be it. And the app was just so full of unnecessary libraries, fragments of other companies' software, including one previous company that was a uh, video remote video doorbell company. They had left the MP3 files for the door sounds in the app. So there were ding dong sounds in the app for a cock cam. This is providing me a lifetime of ding dong jokes that I can legitimately make with this research. Yet another wonderful reason I do this research. So reusing the hardware, you know, wasn't necessarily a bad idea. It's sensible, it saves time, saves money. If it's done right though, if it's not done right, it can actually be a big problem. In this case, a uh, vendor should have had a master repository of all the features that this hardware could have done, but just built in the ones they needed, not you know, build everything in the kitchen sink into this because the more functionality, complexity that you build in, the more things that can go wrong. You're gonna spend a lot more time debugging it. You're gonna spend you know, have some uh, performance problems, perhaps. It just makes more sense to minimize the things that can go wrong. So in this context, uh, with this device, connecting to an external network was built in, but not appropriate for the device. If it had been just its own access point, you connect to it with the app, and it streams to the you know mobile device, what you do with the videos after that is your problem. But the fact that it connects to an external network, you can see situations where this thing could be theoretically broadcasting out to the internet at large or to everyone on a public network that you're using this on if you're in a shared environment like that. Talking to the, the vendor, the designer manufacturer was kind of a nightmare. They essentially got railroaded into this design. They went with their spec sheet of what they wanted and the vendor was like, you know, we'll just take what this thing we've already got built slap a new skin on it and call it a day, you know, rename the thing and call it a day. That's not a good way to do things. There's a thing in uh, startup culture right now of minimum viable product, which means just barely get it to work to where the customer will want to buy it and then ship it. You know, we'll fix it later. The problem is this also means minimum viable security is often the uh, what ends up getting shipped as well. And this is a problem because if you don't have things like an update path or um, a way to alert users to update, you know, 
are you going to ever get these things fixed? It may be cheaper, but it will come to haunt you. Be it bad press or, depending on the type of device, lawsuits. You know? Vendors of IoT and IOD need to spot these design and manufacturers that push and railroad into designs that aren't necessarily taking in their uh, customer's best interest into mind and stop using them. You know, we need to talk amongst each other and say, hey, this vendor turns out a lot of crappy products. Let's stop using them. You know, let others know. Because there's always new people entering the market with an idea. That's fine. But they need to know that, you know, what may be the cheapest vendor has problems. You know, we almost need like a, a Yelp for these kind of uh, manufacturers. And manufacturers are often not concerned about things like updates because there's no money to be made in updates because they sell the hardware and you know ship the app with it and then they say well why should we add features or, or fix bugs you know people will keep buying this thing and we have no financial interest in, in doing that you know we're going to move on to the next customer that's scary and dangerous and because things like sex carry cultural taboos insecure adult products could destroy a small company um, with what it costs to settle after a lawsuit we vibe who is not a small company but a uh, issue with their privacy policy in the app actually cost them five million dollars in a class action lawsuit not a small chunk of change failure to understand what you're building can also lead to physical harm as well the cock cage calamity good reason to use chicken coops in the talk so recently in coordination with the company pentest partners we had to drop essentially an o-day on an iod product we didn't actually drop any code or anything because as soon as you looked you understood the problem um, and it was very very easy to replicate and i never really wanted to do this to any uh, vendors because i've always found them very good but our hand was kind of forced we bad things did end up happening from this unfortunately from this disclosure but we had no choice because if we couldn't alert the public then even worse things would happen if things happen in a vacuum and you know the company wasn't aware at least what the problem was that we were going to announce and you know at least have an a heads up before bad things started happening but this is a very good opportunity to learn about what not to do when someone reports a vulnerability to your company the device in question is the cellmate. It's uh, essentially a male chastity device. It locks around the genitals and is controlled via Bluetooth. Uh, mobile app connects to a REST API backend. The idea is that the wearer you know, has the app on their phone but you know, that is paired with the device, but they cannot control it. Another partner is able to you know, decide when to unlock and release the genitals. Uh, it's part of a, a power play thing. All the functions for this to unlock, lock, etc., require API access, and that becomes important later. An initial look at the API was very alarming. Queries for you know member ID uh, information. If you gave it a blank search string, that came up as a wildcard in the database, and it gave you everything absolutely everything about every user emails passwords in clear text phone numbers you know location data in some cases when i first looked at this device this scared me but due to connection issues um and you know uh, from my home internet connection i never followed up uh, right away and that particular vulnerability was fixed uh, fairly quickly afterwards when I did to check it again. Life unfortunately gets a, a, in the way of research, but it was on my radar. You know, it was a device I was aware of. In May of 2020, I was contacted by Mike, uh, who found some issues in the app and the API. Now, they weren't a security researcher, they were a developer, and they wanted to do the right thing and report this. You know, they, they knew enough to say, this isn't right, this is a problem, this is bad coding. I want them to fix this. So 
new of the Internet of Dongs project reached out and helped, asked if I would contact QIUI, the vendor that uh, makes the product, uh, and act as a proxy for them to report this vulnerability. This is something I've actually done a couple of times with the Internet of Dongs project. Uh, what they had found was that plain text passwords were exposed, uh, poor or no authentication on certain API calls, and with enough digging, the API would re still expose all user details and enough information for remote takeover of accounts and thereby control of the associated devices. I took their report, some light editing, um, and passed it along to QIUI, who I uh, had established contact with the CEO. Provided them the report, provided offers to explain things, go into detail if they needed to, you know, uh, had, didn't ask for anything, you know, didn't need any pay or, or you know, contracts or anything. And then we waited and waited reached out, got assurances, yes, yes, we're working on it, and continued to wait. A few small changes have been made by June 2020, but the whole thing was still very broken. August rolls around, and we were not encouraged. There were no replies at this point. We were, we were you know, inquiring as to what the status was. We we're not getting any response. No updates, no progress that we could see. In September, uh, Alex Lomas of uh, Pentest Partners uh, tweeted out a, uh, their frustration at uh, the state of, of some teledildonic uh, device security, thinking that it should be up there with healthcare and banking, considering the importance to some people, and was just very frustrated with this particular disclosure he was working on. And the frustration level sounded very familiar. So I reached out, Alice confirmed, yes, it's QIUI. I said, okay, we have been trying to do disclosure since May, we need to talk. So I got onto a, a call with them and confirmed, you know, that they had found a lot of the same things we had. Uh, we compared notes and decided, okay, we need to get a uh, joint message to this, this company. Because now two independent researchers had found the same issues. Later on, a third person actually emerged that uh, had also found these things. So it wasn't long before someone with negative and you know, bad intentions would find this. And this was over a span of six months we had been reporting this and encouraging the company and offering help, and they had done practically nothing. We put together combined communication to the company saying that we all knew, we would all been talking, and they very much needed to deal with these issues quickly. More assurances that a new API was coming, you know, were made. While that new API was a bit of an improvement, because of backwards compatibility issues they had, they'd left the old insecure API still running. And this is a major design flaw on you know, the, the device and the app. Because the device relied on the API to generate a device-specific token to issue the unlock command or Bluetooth. The device itself had a, a hard-coded, you know, unique key hard-coded into it that the app would take, send to the API, and then receive a you know, response token that would you know, allow for unlock. There was no mechanical or emergency unlock for this device. This is something that is basically clamped around genitals. You know, involving a steel ring. Basically, to get this thing off would require bolt cutters in a place one typically doesn't want to have bolt cutters. So if there was no API connectivity, or account access was lost, or you know the, the person's mobile device broke, or, or whatever, you couldn't get the unlock token, and there was no way to release the device. You know, even in an emergency. This concerned us greatly because beyond personal identification disclosures, we were very urgent in our, our warnings because they were about to release a couple of new devices that scared us. One was an anal chastity device modeled after a medieval torture device called the Pair of Anguish. 
Another was a remote controlled shock collar. You could shock someone over the internet, you know, via a Bluetooth enabled shock collar, basically. One can imagine the sort of, you know, situations that could occur if somebody got remote access to their API back in and could say issue shocks to everyone all at once. What if they found a way to up the voltage? This is scary stuff. Because their design, partially due to the, the communities that these devices are, are um, marketed to, they didn't design for failure or emergencies. Which is interesting because with you know, the BDSM community that would be a fan of these devices, safety is, you know, very much a key component of that, of their activities. You know, a manual release method may be counteractive to the purpose of the device for some people, but emergencies happen, and that needs to be considered. So in late uh, 2020, September of 2020, with no response and no plan, just a very beta test app, you know, that barely worked. Many of the same API issues still existed even in the new one. They still had not shut down the old API. We basically threw down the gauntlet and said, you have a week to come up with a workable plan to fix these issues. We weren't specifying that they had to have a full timeline, but they had to show that they were actively working on this, you know, and when they would shut down you know, be able to shut down the old API. We're more than willing to give them assistance and give them more time if uh, they had a plan and they never responded. So on October 6th, Pentest Partners and I uh, released information about our struggles to report the issues. And the problem is that when you shine a light on something like this, other people can look. And because it was so easy for us to find, it was so easy for them to find. We didn't release any technical details but it wasn't hard to find. And then all hell broke loose. One fun thing though was we made the BBC uh, Cryon, the text at the bottom of, of BBC World. Uh, that's sort of a new achievement. Um, but then users on their forums uh, started getting messages that they would, were locked out of their accounts and were demanding Bitcoin in order to restore access. We now live in a day and age of sex toy ransomware. Yeah, I had the same kind of you know, thought. <laughs> it didn't take long for people to reverse engineer those old apps uh, and using the old API to discover the same things. They basically just iterated the user IDs you know, a standard set of commands to transfer the device, uh, control the device to the attacker, and then automatically send a message to them to demand uh, Bitcoin. The user forums were freaking out. And in of itself, that was interesting because some people were very incensed at being, you know, locked out. You know, they're incensed at the company or, or whoever was doing this. Other people were kind of titillated at the idea of being locked out permanently from their devices. Again, we don't judge. But uh, it was a serious issue when you, you know, really get down to it. And this sort of thing had to happen with some device sooner or later. Um, it's just unfortunate that we couldn't get them to fix it before uh, something bad had to happen to people. QIUI put out a, a message with a uh, escape method if the people should find themselves locked out. It involved prying with a screwdriver. Again, not something that I was uh, particularly comfortable recommending to people. Um, pretty much every escape methodology required damaging or destroying the device, which you know, these are not cheap devices. You know, they very quickly put out some app updates, uh, but they failed to take down the old API because again, they, until everyone had been moved to the new APIs, they couldn't shut down the old one. So they literally painted themselves into a corner. Uh, eventually they realized, you know, where the source of their problem was and basically just issued an unlock to everyone, you know, made it so that the, the new app could unlock any of them. 
this allowed people you know the opportunity if they shut down the api to still be able to get out which is something that should have been there from day one they quickly migrated um, as you can see in their message they still required you to sideload the app meaning you probably wouldn't be getting automated updates like it would from you know the google play store or uh, any of the other app stores that's a whole other talk in and of itself problems there the new versions were, were definitely better in security, but still far, far from where one would hope that they would be. This is a company that just left their entire infrastructure open to the world. And one of their solutions was to start doing real name authentication that they required, you know, a driver's license or ID card or something, you know, and pictures thereof to sign up for this app. This made no sense because if somebody is going to do something bad they're going to find a way around this and now you've just created even more of a treasure trove for them there's an idea in you know security where collect as little information as you have to about your customers because then you don't have to protect as much particularly with things like sex toys if you don't collect it then you don't have to worry about it being lost this makes perfect sense. And this past January, uh, VX Underground, uh, who collects uh, malware samples, put out this rather amusing tweet saying, we'd like to uncomfortably announce we've received the source code to IoT ransomware that targets male chassis devices. Reading through the code was actually rather interesting because it was literally just iterate through user IDs, you know, get a uh, uh, get their password through the API call, log in, change the uh, 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 ownership, send a message. This was ridiculously simple. It's not ransomware per se, because it wasn't actually like encrypting the device or anything, it was just changing a password on an account. But this sort of attack is certainly not gonna be the last on any of these kind of platforms. So it was interesting to see. Another last IoT fail I wanted to discuss, well, not necessarily a sex toy, it was a safety product that makes the danger even greater. 2017, I noticed an app in Google uh, Play Store for uh, advertising for a Bluetooth-enabled piece of jewelry. Now, this was uh, called the Ivy, and it was a, a brooch or a bracelet you know, that uh, was Bluetooth-enabled, and the large stone you see there uh, was basically a large button so you could tap it you know once twice three times it, would, it was paired with an app that would send a text or a voice alert uh, if you felt uh, uh, in danger or something so you could basically be at a bar with friends and say you know send a message to your friend saying hey come rescue me this person that's uh, uh, talking to me is really boring you know come get me um, kind of a good idea you know, Bluetooth LE, mobile backend, web API, pretty standard for IoT stuff. I grabbed the app just to, out of curiosity and took it apart to, to see what made it tick. I really wish I hadn't. Because within two minutes after reverse engineering the app, I was looking at personal identifying information. Names, addresses, email addresses, phone numbers, the whole shebang. There was a hard-coded IP for their API server in it. And when you visited that IP, every directory was indexed with no authentication needed. It showed you every file on that server. You could use um, their web service, the PHP web service, to uh, iterate through user IDs, you know, pull up all the user account names. You could see their usage history, you know, how many times it's been used, who it had called pull down all their profile photos. You could even see all the alert messages that they had, uh, the users had recorded uh, to be sent in case of emergencies. There were some in there that were not pleasant, shall we say. One of the more interesting discoveries in one of these directories was an iOS developer private key. This is what was used to sign their iOS app before it went to the Apple Store. I could assign the new version of their app with this key and it would be accepted by Apple. 
that's terrifying. There's backup files for pretty much every configuration file on the server, including the root MySQL uh, password. A .git folder that had in the web root that had credentials to the Git repo with all their hard-coded secrets and everything. These credentials also appear to have push access to the repo so I can make changes. PHP my admin with default credentials was so unconfigured, but we had the password, so I could even make myself, you know, access to the database with, you know, a nice GUI for an end. And text files lying around for even other company, you know, projects by the same company. And this was only after 20 minutes of work. This was so incredibly simple. You know, it was scary. And this is a safety device. And they leaked everything. They did zero for security. I tried many, many times to get a hold of this, this company. Never a response, no fixes. Fortunately, as of uh, early 2019, this is no longer on sale. It's still listed on Amazon and such, but they don't, uh, it was just sold out, and the website for it is, you know, no longer there. This is the sort of thing that easily gets someone killed. You know, you could redirect alerts, or if someone's being stalked, this could provide all sorts of other information. Probably the worst IoT fail I've found so far, and the sort of thing that keeps me up at night. Oh, and this company also makes medical equipment. Let's hope they're not recycling code for that. I mean, it was things like blood pressure monitors and, and non-invasive stuff. But still, that's terrifying that the same company would do, you know, doing medical devices is doing something like this. Ostensibly, a good idea, but the worst implementation possible. But there is help and hope. Now, the automotive regu you know, regulations, like, you know, in our building a car example earlier, there's a lot more there. But we're just starting to see some regulation and advice for IoT. In 2018, the UK put out their IoT code of practice for security. And it was really simple, basic things. Remember I said that we've been dealing with these kind of problems for 15 years and we've solved most of them. Things like no default passwords, have a vulnerability disclosure policy, have a method for secure updates, store credentials securely make sure your communications channels are secure least privilege least attack surface don't you know give everybody access to everything verify you know updates verify the software integrity see if something's been tampered with protect personal information yeah. australia in 2020 released their code of practice for security and it and not by accident it's basically the same as the UK one, because a good idea is a good idea, and they just decided to continue going with that. In amongst a lot of other news going on, uh, something that was missed was that in December of 2020, uh, the US signed the cybersecurity, IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act. Now this bill required NIST and uh, OMB to take sp specified steps to increase cybersecurity for Internet of Things devices. And basically, NIST has been asked to come up with standards, and the US government will uh, require those standards to be met for any device that it buys. What those standards are remain to be determined, but I think we can guess that they're going to be based uh, pretty closely on the UK and uh, Australian uh, models. Now, you know, the US government being a, a sizable market, this is going to create a, a sizable market for uh, devices that meet this standard, and that's an incentive to build for uh, secure environments, you know, for uh, secure standards. Because why limit your market? If you build it secure, you can sell it to those that don't care about security and those that actually do. This won't necessarily help the you know Internet of Dogs market, you know, because I don't think the U.S. government buys a hell of a lot of connected sex toys. I don't know, but. At least it's a standard that we can point to and say, hey, is it a bad idea to meet this level? You know, build secure and you won't have any limits on the markets. So some closing thoughts. We've created these tools and frameworks to build some absolutely amazing things. But we haven't required uh, uh, or 
made it so that we need to understand the underlying technologies and previous experience as to you know what to do what not to do so we're putting in the hands of people who don't know any better a homer simpson giving them the tools to build a car from scratch without knowing you know the 80 or almost 100 years of experience of what not to do so anyone can design and build a car but doesn't mean they can do it well anybody can come up with an idea for an iot device doesn't mean they have to, can do it well barrier to entry has been made so incredibly low it allows for truly terrible designs that you know either through ignorance indifference or just simple greed you know these things will make it to market without any oversight and the consumers generally don't know any better you know they go for the cheapest device well cheapest is unfortunately often the one with the most uh, insecure implementations you know i'm not a huge fan of of regulations and standards uh, i think they should be minimal but they are needed to help establish a baseline or at least a common language that everybody can talk and point at um and require because these are things we've been dealing with for 15 or 20 years this should not be new we, we've solved these we just need to clue everybody in because no one wants or intends to build a device that's insecure and you know has their customer's data compromised as a design feature nobody does that you're probably not going to be in business you know that long but unfortunately a lot of companies that do this are in business far too long uh, because they never get held to account tools and warnings on these devices in the software should be made easier to digest for non-technical people infosec is very bad for error messages that um, are very confusing or, or hard to understand think you know every time you see an ssl error message how many people's brains just turn off and they don't understand what it's saying you know we need to limit the ability to do insecure choices why why we are allowing you know http when https is so simple now you know this should be something that is by default in all these frameworks and everything. you have to put effort in to turn that off we need to build bridges with industries that previously have not had to deal with these problems uh, because a lot of them just don't know they don't interact with people like us we need to reach out to industries and companies that are making the leap into iot and offer some guidance and support and we also infosec and public in general need to realize there are risque industries adult industries are a major one that you know some companies are like well i don't want to be associated with that and it's like these are people they can be hurt you know these are legal devices people are buying them it's just another iot device you know we need to realize and get over some of these stigmas outsourcing may be cost effective but you're putting your control and in the case of some of these iod devices other things in someone else's control they may not have your best interests in mind because they want to keep their costs down you may want to bring some of that design in-house you know have a roughed out you know product design that you then take to somebody else but have the standards already set for security and privacy and attention to uh, things like privacy of consumer information the same people making a poorly insecure you know fridge could be designing something more important later on if a company has a track record of these you know it may be that you know a fridge manufacturer outsources it to another company that you know outsources it again to somebody else we need to be identifying who those root causes are that are coming up with a lot of these poor designs and stop using them and last but not least we need to stop buying insecure products they may be cheap they're plentiful out there we need to do our research more you know as a society and just say no we don't want that so thank you very much my website for the internet of dongs uh, email and uh, thanks to circuit swan nikita and straith 
for their advice on this and uh, look forward to questions. Thank you.